So everybody is unmuted now. If you want at least force unmuted, if you want to talk, please um, uh, enable your microphone and uh, ask whatever you're interested in. If there's nobody right now with immediate questions, then I would like to post one. Which is you were talking about the controlled vocabularies that have and uh, that you are not entirely happy with where they are um, configured. So, for example, the Yana MIME types are currently part of the uh, of the schema. Um, mm -hmm. Isn't that, that that obviously doesn't make so much sense? So, is it necessary to maintain all these vocabularies in the schema? Can they not be controlled? at the level of the registry of, of a registry so when things are submitted to registry at that point they are validated but if somebody you know creates a document and doesn't submit it to any any particular registry um, the schema would just simply ignore it i mean do we have to globally through schema enforce these things or are they only relevant at the time that the metadata is actually published uh, as I said before, this is done so that we can have um, uniformity uh, of uh, uh, of the metadata records, despite of where they come from. Um, this is still something that we are looking into. If we think that it's best to leave this open, not just for Yanamime type, but for other. Uh, vocabularies as well just point to an external URL where the vocabulary is uh, resides I think yes we could do that um, the benefit is is that if someone creates an XML record he will be immediately notified of the mistakes they make the shortcoming is that you cannot have the full list of IANA MIME types, especially because IANA MIME types are being updated all the time. So this is something that I would really like to have the feedback of the um, rest of the people before deciding otherwise. This is, I think, one of the things that could be put up for discussion either now or uh, within the working group one again. Uh, does anyone else have an, some experience with uh, the way open control vocabularies are used? Right? Core is a global aggregator of open access research papers. I said for UK, but it's not for UK content only. It's funded by UK. Thanks. Hi, Penny. This is Margaret from Frontier. Hi, Muppet. Hi, just a quick question. Another slide about publishing. So, um, in this, what is it called? A schema or a semantic that you're proposing? Is that a proposal for publishers to actually follow for our um, articles or scholarly communications to be um, next in data mineable? Is that a correct proposition on that slide? Um, for publishers like Frontiers, uh, I think they should uh, basically, uh, the idea is that they will come through either open air and core. In both cases, uh, both open air and core guidelines will be enriched with the uh, specific properties, the specific metadata elements that we require for open minded if you want to be TDM able. For instance, we need to have a license. Um, we would like for each article to include information on uh, the language, the format, etc. Uh, we definitely want to have a link to the full text and this has to be normalized across all publishers. If publishers don't uh, give their resources in this way, they will not be able to be uh, imported into open-minded. So it's open air or core guidelines together with some specifics for open-minded. 
good. That's clear. So I understood your slide correctly. So mm -hmm. my second question is then, in conversations outside of the more challenge, the more challenge of defining is really standards and making the um, manuscripts, the articles, the data, uh, to expose them for text and data mining. So outside of open mind mining, do you have these conversations to push for, for uh, standard among uh, scholarly communications? Have you had conversations pushing for the standard? And if the answer is yes, what's the what's the feedback? Are they supporting it? Is there uh, energy to actually do it? Is there resistance? Sorry, Mabat, I'm losing you. The, uh, your microphone is coming up in, uh, in and out. Uh, well, can you repeat the question? Okay, I will repeat the question very, very quickly. Um, outside of the minted our project, are you mm -hmm. also pursuing the same standards um, with other scholarly communications, other entities and projects, so that we achieve a standard across and an interoperability across different uh, groups or you know, associations. If I, sorry, no, go ahead. I'm going to do you all, do you all, can you all listen to Muppet? I get something about standards for scholarly publications with other communities, but I'm not sure. Is that it? Whether we are yes. discussing yes. that? So you, so so you answered my question about. Uh, frontiers as a publisher connecting mm -hmm. via open air, via core into the open minted project. So that's clear. The next question is outside our project, mm -hmm. outside open minted, across text and data mining components, are you having conversations to also propose a similar standard for interoperability? And do you get energy to do it, or is there a challenge not to do it? You know, what's the energy like? with other TDM communities. Yes. We are discussing with uh, various infrastructures, but I'm not sure if that's what you want. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not. So, so I guess the answer is, yes, you are uh, uh, having conversations with other infrastructure for connections, uh, but outside of that, there is no other um, Quora group that you're talking to. The reason why I'm asking is in the US there is the Force 11, mm -hmm. which is also into a very similar activity, and they're talking about data citations and being able to be discovered. Yeah? So I was yeah. interested if there is a conversation going on between uh, practitioners yeah, and proponents. Mm -hmm actually achieve interoperability outside our own project. So that was where I was coming from. Okay, I'm not involved personally. Maybe someone else from the consortium already is, but thank you for the observation. I'll look into it and uh, I can get more information from you for that. And if we're not already in, um, in some discussion with them, we, we will definitely get into this. And um, sorry, Petra would like to intervene to discuss to to to, the to to give some information about the previous question and getting data from publishers. So I will give the floor okay. to Petra. So oh, thank you, uh, Penny. I just wanted to add um, a, a few things to your response um, and thanks for this. And so it's absolutely right that you know Core and Opener um, kind of establish uh, the way how to how the data can input into open minded. But there is this one component which you rightly pointed out, which is the connector to the publisher systems. And I just wanted to say that what we are addressing here is just hybrid open access content in the main publishers platforms. And these platforms typically do not offer the same kind of interoperability uh, the, the same support, so interoperability support as other repositories. For example, all repositories pretty much offer OAI PMH, but publishers deliberately, I would say, don't want to do that. And, it, and therefore, it is more challenging. We just cannot wait for the publishers that, uh, to come to us and say, oh, here's your content. Feel free to aggregate it. If we did that, it would never happen. So what we, uh, our approach here is to address the four biggest publishers, Elsevier, Springer,
Baker, Taylor and Francis and Wiley and Blackwell in a specific way so that we get the content from them in any way that is possible. That means in developing specific connectors to each of these four publishers and for the long tail of publishers, because we can't do it for all the publishers that exist, uh, we will be relying on, on uh, Crossref and um, the, the kind of systems which help us to find, um, uh, to, to find the full text. But we know that these systems don't work properly. There's lots of inconsistencies and uh, consequently uh, we want to make sure that for the largest amount of open access content that is available, we can get it and, um, uh, and, and can kind of harmonize access um, to, um, to that data. Uh, so I think that that's basically what I want to say. We're not waiting for Elsevier to come to us and tell us, mm -hmm. here's the content. We are actively actually getting the content from them, whether they want it or not. <laughs> Thank you, Petr. Uh, I think that's the idea about it. The idea is trying to get the information where we can, as long as it's open access, and where, as you said, trying to harmonize it. So the source may differ. What we want to arrive when we get to open-minded is to have some kind of uh, uniform, harmonized, interoperable uh, way of uh, showing this, at least at the metadata level. OK, so thank you very much for the information. That's what I wanted to hear. And, mm -hmm. and yes. Uh, better, I think if you're addressing the four major open access publishers, then I think that's volume, uh, a good mass that actually uh, establish a, a, um, a standard, you know, across to, to exchange information. So thank you. Yes, Richard. Again, I would ha I would have another question if uh, nobody else has at this point, um, which is um, the question whether unique identifiers can be assigned. Um, by by whoever, so is it sufficient to have a to have a best practice to ensure that identifiers don't clash with each other, um, so that we can, for example, consider Maven identifiers, which can consist of a group ID, which should be a, uh, which should basically be a domain name that you control, and an artifact ID and a version. Um, are these sufficient, or is it? absolutely necessary that everybody is using something like EOI or Handle um, to have a centralized uh, centralized um, infrastructure that, that is mandatory to assign all these uh, identifiers. So I, see, I know that both is being used and that both, both are being used in large ecosystems. I have the feeling that both work, but I would like to hear uh, what are your opinions? Okay, I'll start, and if anyone else is uh, willing, can also uh, point out their opinion. Um, I think position identifiers is definitely needed, as if you, as you said yourself, Maven identifiers are not guaranteed to be unique, and in order to have proper citation and proper attribution and proper identification of a resource, we must be sure that there is a unique identifier and has to be persistent so that the resource can be found again especially for experiment for uh, for repeating experiments so this is very important who has the authority to assign persistent unique identifiers okay doi has become now the established authority for uh, publications but it's not the only authority list out there. I would strongly recommend DOI for publications. For data sets, for software services, this is coming more and more into the landscape from what I see in other projects as well, in other infrastructures as well. Hand is mostly used for them. Data site also assigns um, unique identifiers. I think Xenodo has their own system for assigning identifiers. Uh, I'm not the expert for PIDs, sorry. But the idea is that in any case, regardless of where it comes from, we have to have a persistent unique identifier. That's my opinion. That's my personal opinion as well. Uh, who it comes from and which one should attribute, should assign the identifier is another question. Especially for 
objects like uh, um, that are not yet how should I say that are not I mean a publication is something that exists uh, a corpus made from publications based on uh, a user query who, uh, that has some que uh, user has created is something temporary when should be, it be assigned a persistent identifier? To me, that's a more important question than attributing it to a software component that is there. Similarly, a workflow that is created once and may never be reused, when should it be assigned uh, a persistent unique identifier? That's the question that open-minded should look into. Take it for granted that single resources Will, will and should have a PID. The next question is when do things that are constructed in open-minded take receive uh, be assigned um, a PID and by whom? That's my question. Are you still there? Anyone else who wants to comment on this? I mean, in, in the last, um, uh, in the workshop that we had at LREC, um, people were uh, proposing uh, approaches that do, were doing like content-based hashing, like to, to generate mm -hmm. globally unique identifiers from the actual artifacts um, because of problems with centrally, uh, uh, even with centrally uh, assigned PIDs. So if I submit something to Zenodo and I submit something to Clarin Lindat and I submit something to Maven, I have already three uh, identifiers. Three identifiers, yes, I know. I know three identifiers, but there are ways of linking between them. Yes, but is that is that the kind of is defies the idea of having a globally unique identifier, doesn't it? I mean, if I assign it myself, at least, um, I mean, in, in the Maven world, it seems to work quite well, so people as assign these identifiers, and there's hardly ever any clashes. And there's no need for linking or something. And it's also a matter of granularity because the type is you not know, for software. Um, if, if I if I upload anything like a software library, for example, to to uh, to Zenodo or to Lindat, um, it these systems work in a different way. So whatever identifier I get from them is not immediately usable in the wide. Uh, it, um, in, 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 in development environments, for example, as, as a Maven identifier. So there's this uh, disalignment. Mm -hmm. But that means that we want a better controlled central authority for these identifiers. doesn't mean that they should not be there. The idea of having a PID is still there. The concept, there's a reason behind it. So if I might add to this, I really like the fact that uh, Richard made exactly this comment. We, in fact, as you, as you were um, responding, Penny, uh, we were actually with Lucas discussing exactly the same thing, which uh, which uh, uh, Richard said: distributed uh, registration of uh, uh, of identifiers, and that you know through hashing this is possible today and actually works in various fields. And what is interesting on the scholarly communications field, and we have one authority. Which is Crossref, Crossref that basically, uh, you know, to wh to which people pay for registering DOIs, and all they have to do is to generate identifiers and have a resolution service, and it seems a very like very successful, um, a successful uh, venture basically to do this uh, today, and. Um, uh, 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 but it has obviously one um, issue, which is that you rely on one entity. Crossref is behaving reasonably well today. It's a not-for-profit, uh, not-for-profit body, but in reality, no one else can provide this resolution service very easily. So I think distributed services are very useful. And there is also one issue, which I see with just one entity having an access. You, you said that one of the important issues for uh, an identifier, one of the important characteristics, is for it to be persistent. And uh, um, what I would argue is that these identifiers in Crosshair, these DOIs, they are not persistent. They are persistable. So they can be persistent as long as the database is maintained properly. 
but there is obviously no guarantee that it will always be, and there will always be issues. And I, I would argue that if you have, if you use something like hashing, you can possibly generate much more persistent, um, like even theoretically persistent identifiers. So you think this is worth investigating into and discussing for I, I, how to do that? I think um, I, I think that it, it's just more like a comment on the world in which we live. Mm -hmm. uh, we probably have to live with the fact that you know identifiers are global, but uh, um, I think uh, for the purposes of giving identifiers, I think the distributed technologies work fairly well, especially in the context of you know if we are uh, if our project is about openness, open science, you know all kind of approaches which are transparent, then I think um, we should use. Uh, these approaches where possible. I think that's the only comment. I'm not saying that we're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm open to the issue. I think one of the most important things in the distributed hash and properties is that it may resolve the problem that I said before about virtual collections of data sets and uh, 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 workflows that are being that are created for a temporary um, for a short period of time that are not being reused. That might help I suppose as well. So it's worth looking into as a technology. Um, excuse me, may I just make one comment? Can you hear me? I'm not sure. Yes. Um, with regard to the degree of documentation completeness, you, you said that you are not sure whether subject or subject classification should be obligatory. I would really just like to, to appeal to you to <laughs> to think of ways how to make this mandatory, a mandatory field, because I think no matter what the exact use case will be, um, yeah, a selection, being able to select um, for a certain subject or discipline would be the starting point for, for any user of, of any text and data mining platform or infrastructure. So if you could keep on trying to find a way how to make this mandatory, this yeah. subject field, this would be great, I guess. Yeah, I absolutely agree. The idea for me is to have, uh, as I said, having multiple ways of uh, getting the information. Right now, most of the people will just put keywords in publications, so at least you get some information about subject classification. If it comes from libraries, you also have proper subject classification according to uh, an authority list, so you allow both uh, uh, both types of information to go into the metadata records. And I think what we should also try to look into is whether we could have some um, subject classification at least for the for a coarse grained classification let's say upper levels of scientific uh, uh, disciplines this is medicine this is uh, uh, astronomy things like that at least for that that yeah. could be probably the the first step into making the the element itself mandatory mm -hmm. yeah yeah Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Yeah. So I, I wonder if I can um, add to this uh, also one thing and maybe a, 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 a side question. I think the issue with getting uh, content with um, which has assigned disciplines is that it needs to be provided by the source. And what we see on a regular basis is that this information is just not provided by the source, and if it is provided, it could be inconsistent. So I think what many also kind of see, and I think this is certainly the experience of open air and core, is that this can only be done at the level of some software actually classifying the uh, uh, the, the content and giving it, yeah. uh, you know, assigning the kind of assigning each publication into some sort of a taxonomy uh, or you know, any kind of structure. These structures can change, so th that's the reason why you need the software even more, um, and the software is really critical here. So I feel that the solution to this is not making something 
required, you know, uh, you know, making a requirement on the source is unlikely, in my opinion, to work. But what is necessary is that we have software to, as reliably as possible, assign publications into disciplines so that this kind of work, which was suggested, um, can be done. I wonder what's your view on this, Penny? I absolutely agree. I mean, it's it's the idea of using open mind to TDM in general tools to find uh, automatically some information. Topic classification, language identification can also work for identifying uh, the language uh, because more, in most cases uh, this is not provided in the metadata that we get. Okay, but I still think that um, Okay, let's do it automatically and at the same time force the source, the scholars, to provide this information. The publishers um, try to find a balance between the two, Petro. We use automatic topic classification works pretty well. Okay, but it tends to create groups of uh, values together from in a um, more, how should I say that, um, from the bottom <laughs> rather than I, the top. I would also like to have something on the top for subject classification. But yes, let's use the tools that are going to be put in open-minded to improve the resources that we have, to improve the metadata that we have. So I don't know what your opinion is on that, Pedro. Can we uh, also have? I, yeah, I didn't realize you were asking your question. Okay, so um, um, I, I personally feel that I mean we we've done done some experiments on, for example, classification of texts mm -hmm. into the high level classes using separate vector machines, and I would say that uh, you know it worked it up to some extent, but it's insufficiently um, it, it, the quality is insufficient for due to various reasons. Um, I also feel that um, so I think. You know, purely classifying on content is probably, I think the content itself is an insufficient indicator. I think we need more data. Um, and, and, and I think there's lots of ideas on how this can be done. Um, in the past, one of the work, things that worked in terms of classification the best, which I have ever seen, it was uh, to use information about users who actually see the content. So when you have, when you have some sort of knowledge of the people who come and download the particular uh, the particular publications, and you know that, for example, what they do, the main the main field of study is, let's say, computer science, then you know that most of the con documents they go to and visit and download are computer science, and this is a very good signal for document classification, uh, and, uh, and and that could be obviously combined with the content uh, features, but um, I think using content itself, like using topic models, is is not producing sufficient quality. Yeah. Of, um, of the results, and um, I also am also a little bit skeptical personally with regards to um, the use of uh, taxonomies where the source actually classifies the content. The reason is that the more fine-grained the taxonomy, the more misclassifications we see across different providers. So, you know, you, re you basically end up with some sort of fine-grained classification, but the resources are not properly classified into the classes because every person does it differently. And the next thing is that these classifications change over time. So what do you do then? Do you re require the source to reclassify? So it's a, it's, it's a big issue, and, and I think it's only solvable through using lots of different features, and, uh, and the content is just one of them. And I think the putting burden on the source is, is not going to work. Uh, we see it, you know, you know, if this was something that was working, then Google would require meta tags on topics, but they, that's what they don't do. So that's my view, obviously. Okay, yeah. Yes, I think subject classification is one of the big problems that we're, uh, that we're facing in our uh, current er, in our area, yeah. Anyone else has uh, some comments or questions either on subject classification or on something else? So there's a question uh, in the chat. Why don't we use RDF model or a lot? Yes, we've looked into linked uh, uh, 
Okay, the OMTD share schema is right now implemented as an XSD, but uh, it can easily be uh, converted into an uh, ontology and can be exported into uh, RDF uh, records, RDF JSON or whatever records. This is something that ha we have done before together with the linked data community for the MetaShare metadata records and this is uh, something that we plan to do also for open-minded. Uh, for the time being we've stuck to XSD and XML uh, for reasons of, uh, to start with, for the current uh, uh, registry that we're using, but this is something that is doable and will be done. I hope that answers your question, Aras. I'm not sure if Aras or Hitler is the first name, sorry. Have I missed any other questions in the chat? Uh, um, uh, uh, Hidir is asking if you make use of SCOS. So uh, I think we probably yes. don't because SCOS is to align uh, different um, ontologies with each other, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And we do not at the present time align the open minted share with anything else, or do we, Penny? Not yet, but this is something to be done in the near future. This is something that we've already done, as I said before, for MetaShare. MetaShare was transformed from XSD into OWL, and this is something that we will also do for Open Minded. And there we can use scores, links to other metadata schemas as well. So this is going to happen in the next version. Hope this answers the question. Any other questions or comments? So, if there's nothing, I know more comments. Okay. Um, before closing this session, I just want to remind you all for the uh, next webinar in the Open Mind Interoperability webinar series. And this is going to be on. Uh, next Wednesday at 3 o'clock uh, Central European time and it's going to be about workflow interoperability. This time we'll talk about software. So the, t the title is uh, Minimalist Approach to Workflow Interoperability and I would like to invite you to join this uh, webinar as well. Thank you all for, the, for attending this uh, work, uh, webinar. I don't know if uh, Richard you have anything to Add? Uh, no, I would also like to thank you, Penny, for the excellent presentation and for leading the discussion and for all the great answers that you had. Thanks, everybody, for the contribution and for your discussions. It was very interesting. And um, I hope it will be interesting for everybody who will watch this uh, once we publish the video. <laughs> thank you all for attending it and thank you all for the discussion. Indeed, it has provided us with feedback to go on for the next version of the schema. Thank you.